And welcome uh, to the April uh, Raleigh Astronomy Club uh, meeting. Um, my name is uh, Mike Keefe, and um, I'm one of the co-chairs. Uh, we'll also be joined today uh, by fellow member and NASA uh, Solar System um, Ambassador Doug Lively. Uh, and we're going to talk uh, about uh, Mars exploration, um, the history of Mars exploration, hopefully a very timely topic considering um, how much Mars um, has been in the news and the uh, Perseverance um, uh, mission as well. So with that, I wanna welcome everybody and uh, please feel free to um, put your comments in the chat. We've got folks um, that are monitoring the chat and will uh, hopefully uh, interrupt us if it's a very timely question. Uh, otherwise, we'll make sure that we try and address any questions towards uh, the end. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like for Doug to go ahead and introduce himself. Hey, everybody. Uh, many of you in the club know me, but for those of you who are new, uh, my name is Doug Lively. I am, um, uh, my position in the club is I actually am the club Alcor, which is the Astronomical League Coordinator. So if you have observations or want to learn how to uh, use an Alcor program to improve yourself as an astronomer, I'm the guy to come talk to, and uh, definitely I'm always open by email, or I uh, will set up a Zoom for you. But I'm also a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, and so uh, I'm here to talk to you tonight about a portion of the history of Mars exploration. It's pretty interesting, and I hope you all enjoy the program. Fantastic. So uh, again, my name is Mike Keefe, and uh, I am also a NASA um, uh, JPL Solar System Ambassador. Um, since 2019, and um, you know, you know, people might think, yes, we're the ones that you um, NASA is going to send out when the aliens land. No, <laughs> that's not what that is. Um, however, uh, as part of NASA's charter, um, NASA is required to educate the public on what they're doing, how they're spending you know, uh, tax dollars. Um, so NASA could either send their principal scientists, astronauts, administrators, all that out to the public, and you know take up their valuable time doing that, or what they've decided to do is train a core uh, group of people um, and uh, make sure that you know, we're able to provide um, that educational arm for NASA and, and help educate the public. So that's what uh, we do. Um, so with that, um, before we start the Mars um, uh, actual presentation, I was wondering if uh, anyone wants to drop in the chat real quickly. How many missions, and this is across the Earth, uh, across all these space-faring um, nations, if you will, how many missions have been sent to Mars? So any guesses? So we've got a couple coming in, 15, 19, 25, 20. We've got a good chunk. Well, we're here to tell you that it's been a whopping 47 missions. And um, especially when you think of the earlier missions, um, basically, uh, and I, you've heard the term before, at least I've heard the term before, I don't know about you, Doug, but um, especially early on, everyone said Mars likes to eat spacecraft. <laughs> so uh, this is a great uh, infographic that was put together. It has every one of the 47 missions, and it also does have all of the actual rovers and landers that have at least provided a full picture back to um, uh, Earth. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. But uh, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the, the, the timeline. So with that, I'll hand it over to Doug. All right, everybody, thanks. Uh, so uh, as Mike said, you know, we have all these missions and uh, maybe I'll, I'll let you guys be thinking, maybe you can keep count while we're doing this. How many have been successful? of all those missions that Mike mentioned. As you said, I mean, my, Mars likes to eat spacecraft. And uh, really, uh, you're going to find as we go through this timeline, I mean, we've been trying we, worldwide. We're, uh, we've been, been working at this thing for, for uh, since the 1960s. So let's get started. All right, so the first uh, few spacecraft that we actually had going to Mars were mostly uh, flybys, um, and, uh, and, uh, and we even had one lander. 
uh, and they were all from the Soviet Union. So Mars, uh, they were basically Mars M1, or Mars M1, uh, 1M number two. Um, then there was uh, the, uh, the, M, the MV4, the Mars 1 again, and then, Mar then, then the second revision of the MV3, all, uh, all were sent by Russia. And uh, Mike, you want to, or do you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and they all failed, you know, for one reason or another. Some of them failed uh, to reach orbit. So they got kind of in the general facility, but they just didn't get um, orbit. Some of them had, you know, like, you know, the two MV4, uh, number one, it basically had, it basically, it's, it's block L engine basically just uh, disintegrated um, in lower Earth orbit. You know, some of them didn't even get out of, out of Earth. Um, some of them just kind of lost communication on flyby. So that final one, the MV3, uh, yeah, um, basically it just never left low Earth orbit. So Russia has been trying hard at it, but they didn't do too well. So first five missions were failures. Um, but they were not alone because then we had Mariner 3, um, basically uh, the pair, payload pair, uh, fairing on the, on the, on the, on the uh, missile failed to separate. So that wasn't good. Go on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Mariner 4, Mariner 4 was our first success. And so that was great. And that was the first successful flyby. This was the first close-up picture that we actually got from Mars. So it was, uh, it was, you know, that's deemed a success. It was great. All right. So the next one was Zond 2. Again, this was another one. Uh, can you believe it? They, they, all that time communicating with a spacecraft and they lost communications just before the fly, the flyby. So uh, anyway, so that ended in failure. Let's go on to 1969. Okay. Uh, then we had Mariner 6 and that one was a successful one. We got a few more pictures. Um, uh, again, that one was a flyby. Then Mar, then the Ru Russians sent um, uh, the the 2M mission um, off, um, and it just failed to obtain orbit. It was supposed to be an orbiter. All right. The next one, Mariner 7. Now, so Mariner 7 was successful, and we uh, also got some good pictures out of that one. So that was a very successful successful one. And then the number 522M, uh, number 522 was a failure. Again, that was, they just weren't able to, to get orbit out of it. Yeah, and I think um, it, just to note, what we've done is in each of these um, uh, different missions, we've denoted it, uh, F is if it's a flyby, O if it's an orbiter, uh, you'll see L for a lander, mm -hmm. you'll see R for rover, um, you'll see, uh, um, SR for sample return. So we've tried to denote what type of missions or combinations thereof. Yeah. Great. And let's go on to 71. And so uh, Mariner 8, uh, it, it failed it, it failed to uh, actually a launch failure. So that wasn't good for us. Go on to the next one, Cosmos number 419, launch failure as well. It uh, failed orbit, failed to even get into a low Earth orbit. And the second one, 419, um, so it's 419 and then, uh, yeah, let's go to the Mars to OL. And, and, uh, and then there was a, a Mars 3, which had what had an orbital lander and a rover. And so go ahead with that, those. And then, oh, yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it should be noted that, Doug, we've, we've put this in order and then in the year that they were launched, not when they arrived. Yeah. And then you can see that, uh, of course, Mariner Mariner Nine. Uh, we actually got some some success there with that. You know, the Mars Two and Mars Three were considered uh, successful. It, it entered into orbit, you know, um, and operated for about twenty orbits, and then it was out. And then the lander uh, with with that had a partial success. Is this the one that actually had kind of a thud landing? Yeah, it did. It had, yep. a, had a quote soft landing. <laughs> soft landing. <laughs> And uh, yeah, <laughs> and it uh, it had operated for about ninety seconds, I think, something like yep. that, just enough to get like a partial frame back from the from the uh, from the lander, and then it died. And the, but but again, the, that one was successful. You know, now we have Mars yeah. four, Mars five, Mars six, and more. more they, you know, it, uh, Mars four was a failure. Um, you know, basically, it just failed to. It just like another one. They, the Russians seem to have difficulty getting that orbital insertion. But Mars Five was successful. Mars Six uh, was also successful. But um, 
you know, uh, it lost, uh, it had a lander, but the, we lost contact. It lost contact on landing. So um, it, it got, you know, mostly uh, it wasn't really able to uh, return good data for us. All right. So that's really the, probably the first uh, 13 years worth of, of, of attempts by Russia and America. Yep. All right. You want to go to the next one there, Mike? Yep. So then we'll jump to uh, 1975. And that was the year that um, NASA was able to land both the Viking 1 and Viking 2 landers. Um, and, you know, for comparison, uh, if you think of that, that first lander um, that the Soviets sent lasted 93 seconds. Um, Viking 1 operated for 20, more than 2,400 sols. Um, so that's quite incredible. And Viking 2 operated for almost 1,300 sols. Um, so again, uh, just the landers, but you know, spectacular imagery um, and quite a bit of um, you know, uh, uh, notoriety in that um, you know, they were testing for life forms. And again, questions on how, um, you know, the, the, how the experiments were run and that sort of thing. So I mean, you could do an entire talk about how you know, the, the, the false positives and, and things like that with uh, you know, testing for, for um, you know, microbial life or you know, signs of life on, on Mars. But uh, those were the Viking landers. And then if you look at it, we go, um, you know, it's uh, 13 years before anyone tries to do anything else at, at Mars. Um, so that's quite a big um, separation of time. Um, and towards the end of the Soviet Union, uh, they, they launched their Phobos uh, 1 uh, orbiter and lander, uh, obviously, and that, that was a failure. Um, Phobos 2, um, that did uh, you know, make orbit, but the lander and the rover uh, failed as well. So um, jump into 92. And again, when you think about it, this is 17 years after the Viking landers was the next attempt uh, that um, the US uh, had uh, sent to Mars and Mars Observer uh, Orbiter um, that failed. And fortunately, I cannot recall the specifics on um, what the failure was on, on that one. Um, but then we go to 1996 uh, and this was a, a great success, the Mars Global Surveyor uh, Orbiter. But just real quick, that yep. uh, I was going to say, the Mars Observer lost communications before, right before orbital insertion. So they lost, they couldn't communicate yep. with the crafts that, you know. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, and so then the uh, the newly uh, somewhat formed uh, Russian Federation uh, at that point then sent their Mars 96. Unfortunately, uh, that uh, was also a failure. Um, then we have. Mars, Pathfinder, and Sojourner, and, and this was uh, especially, um, uh, you know, really momentous for me because um, this is really when I you know, I'd gotten out of school and was really, really um, kind of getting more into um, the space um, and space missions and starting to get into astronomy. But um, Pathfinder was launched in um, December of 1996. It landed on July 4th, 97. Uh, it really was just a proof of concept mission. Um, and just like what we're, we see now in some of the, you know, in the um, ingenuity uh, part of the current uh, mission um, on Mars, uh, again, it's just proof of concept. So this is where NASA wanted to show that we could uh, do low cost spacecraft and do frequent launches and do it much cheaper and better. So Mars Sojourner um, Pathfinder was 12 and a half times cheaper than one of the Viking missions. And really the science goals were to return geologic soil um, and magnetic, prop uh, magnetic property and atmospheric data. The uh, Pathfinder station was uh, then later called the Carl Sagan Memorial Station. And then uh, I remember the, uh, the little Sojourner rover, tiny little thing about the size of a microwave. So here we're gonna show. So uh, hopefully everyone remembers those big, uh, huge inflatable um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
basically padding bouncing that they did. Um, and, um, you know, it's a mission that really was only uh, planned to be uh, a month for the actual Pathfinder, so the, the main station, and only a week for Sojourner. But both of them lasted three months. And I think you'll start to hear that's an ongoing story, hopefully, uh, with many of NASA's missions as well. Um, Sojourner only traveled 350 feet or 100 meters away from the, the in, in total. And it never what meant went more than 40 feet or 12 meters from the actual lander. So it did not go very far. And again, total amount of distance traveled was 100 meters. Um, but you had 16,000 plus pictures that came back from the lander. The little rover um, did about 550. And if anyone remembers this, they were publishing almost instantly on the website. In fact, um, JPL had that old website up and running for many, many years. I think it went down about five years ago, finally. Uh, but it was quite impressive that they were really starting to um, leverage the whole idea of the internet and posting pictures frequently. Um, and I remember even at work back then, you know, constantly checking um, the website to see what they found. And I was just enthralled with um, you know, all the different names they gave to all the different rocks and looking at Yogi and Scooby-Doo and, and et cetera. So um, again, just was enthralled with it. Um, but it did return some key findings and you'll, you'll hear of this theme going forward with the rest of the Mars missions, but it found uh, rounded pebbles and, you know, kind of in, at the landing site. And this suggested that all of these rocks, um, you know, had formed um, you know, in running water, had been in essence uh, weathered with uh, from running water um, in a warmer past and you know therefore liquid water must have been stable at some point um, in, in Mars. They also found that the airborne dust is magnetic um, and that also suggests that there was a water cycle in the past because that um, you know that that, that um, uh, iron had leached out of the minerals in the crust because of water being um, as part of a water cycle. So again, you'll notice that you know, they keep talking about the water, fo follow the water, and that will go through many of the, um, uh, the rest of the missions. So that was Pathfinder. Uh, so then we went from uh, Pathfinder, then you had um, Japan sent their first orbiter in 1998, um, which unfortunately uh, was also a failure. Um, we sent the Mars Climate Orbiter in uh, 1998. Again, um, okay, that was not successful. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Doug, you might have to um, yeah. correct me. I think it was the it was the Mars Climate Orbiter um, that was either that one or the Polar Lander. Yeah, no, it's it's the it's the the Mars Climate Orbiter. It was the yeah. one where basically it was developed by two different groups, Oops. and one group was using English met, uh, metrics and the or, or sorry uh, measurements, and the other group was using uh, metrics. Mm -hmm. and literally, it was the conflict. They they didn't talk to one another, and then all of a sudden, uh, as they were as they were coming uh, about to basically to insert into orbit, they realized, wait a minute. <laughs> these these two aren't talking to, together correctly. The, it failed miserably. Yeah, we have we have our units wrong. <laughs> yeah, there are units wrong. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, then again, yeah, you had the 1999 again. Uh, the uh, was, uh, it was supposed to be a lander um, as well as a. Um, uh, that was the one that when it was landing, what what happened was they had a drogue chute on it that deployed, yep. and it basically kind of jerked the lander and mm -hmm. the software thought that it it was um that the engine that it was on the ground and so it initiated engine cutoff and it was still about maybe 20 meters so yeah it's a hard so. hard very hard landing but, and it really didn't land uh, and i can't remember what we had for p um uh, uh, now i can't remember what we had but yeah so that was oh. uh, it essentially could have been a probe of some kind. Uh, Mars 96. I can look that yeah. up real quick. Um, but yeah, so oh, that was, was the penetrator. They had penetrator. That's right. Yeah. yeah, they had a penetrator in it. Yeah. yeah. So then, uh, so Doug, I'll, I'll hand you off to the next um, kind of uh, decade plus of 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 mission <laughs> successes and failures. <laughs> yeah. Ignominious failure. Yeah, sure. Let's go ahead. Let's go to 2001. <laughs> 
a real odyssey. So yep. 2001 odyssey, eh? So that was, exactly. that was a huge success. You know, we basically, uh-huh. um, you know, and it's the thing that's great about this one over engineered, they were built on prior successes, successful orbital insertion, and it's still functioning today. So it's one of the part of what they're doing with, with our, what we did we began to do with our orbiters is we began to build an internet, an internet uh, network among, between the, the landers, or sorry, the orbiters and the landers and of course earth. And so that's really part of the deep space, deep space network. And so Mars Odyssey was really a key component um, to that. So okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's still operational. Let's go to mm-hmm. the next one. All right, Mars Express, um, that was uh, sent by the European Union. And so the orbiter was successful, but you guys might recall, does anybody recall it maybe in the chat what the lander was? I'm watching the chat. So yeah, I don't see anything happening in the chat. So the lander <laughs> the lander was the famous, it was. Eagle, uh, Amy, yeah. Amy, you're right on it. Yes, it was the Beagle, the famous Beagle. Now what's really interesting about that is, that, you know, they have searched for that over and over and over again, a lot of, a lot of theory about what happened. The la- the final theory on that is, is that if you recall, the Beagle was kind of like a pancake, it landed. And when it, when it, it, uh, it landed, it was supposed to open up. It had concentric shells in it. And so it had solar panels that were supposed to flip out to, to power it. There was a, you know, there was a science package. And then the very bottom was a communications package. And so the, the, what they believe has happened and the the final theory on this is, is that the panels did deploy except the last one. And because the last panel didn't deploy, they couldn't raise the, uh, the antenna. And so basically it, it, it died. So, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, it was the beagle. So. (laughs) And not related to uh, the Transformers movie. No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, and then uh, and then we had two major successes, Spirit and Opportunity, um, and those rovers, um, uh, you know, really were only, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, only expected to last 90 days. Yep. But uh, again, NASA over engineers, and look at you on the left, you can see the numbers for uh, for Spirit, and on the right, you can see the numbers for Opportunity. You know, Spirit uh, had a six-year lifespan, lifespan at hundreds of thousands of images, over 124,000 images, traveled 4.8 miles, uh, and its steepest slope was 30 degrees, and unfortunately, that was its, its, uh, uh, its, its end, its demise on that 30-degree slope. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and uh, Opportunity, though, continued going on for 14 more years, and you know, again, over 217,000 images, traveled 28 miles, and its its last, its steepest slope was was 32 degrees. So, I mean, just, you know, inc- and we got some incredible science out of these. You want to go to the next? Uh, yeah, and, and ahead, yeah. just as a, as a reference point, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, it was Apollo 17 um, might have eclipsed in the uh, lunar, um, uh, basically, rover that might have traveled more than 28 miles, but like barely. So, um, you know, when you think about it, you know, rovers are great, but in 14 years, because of the careful nature in which you have to push, you know, deploy a rover and and, and have it uh, move, they don't move very fast or very far in one saw um, on on Mars. Um, So basically in the three days of, um, you know, the Apollo 17, the astronauts traveled 28 miles and then, you know, 14 years is what it took uh, opportunity to do that. So, again, just sh- shouting out the, the difference between a, a robotic mission and a manned mission. Yeah, I'm going to say these these rovers, really the way they were designed, they were really at the peak of where you could really use um, solar powered uh, uh, craft and, and your bat with respect to your to solar power and battery craft, uh, your, your battery life. They really kind of really maximize that. Um, you know, and I know Mike will talk about the others, the other one coming, the other, other two coming up, but let's go on to the next, to the, some of the science and everything that came out of that. So, I mean, these really, you know, unlike, unlike Pathfinder, which was, you know, they did, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit of science with Pathfinder, but it really was not, you know, they didn't really get a lot out of it 
you really got into the science here with respect to seeing that, hey, you know, soak salty waters. You know, we've basically got, you know, um, uh, finding, you know, hematite, you know, uh, which, by the way, we've you know, on Earth, we've we've largely, you know, mined a lot of our natural hematite. We have very little of it left on Earth now. Uh, but there's plenty of it on Mars and it, you know, it has to form in water. So that was uh, definitely a uh, basically a key component there, seeing the, the amount of hematite was there. Uh, you know, also neutral warming, warmer water, you know, they found, you know, rocks with, that had a lot of magnesium and iron carbonates in them. You know, it had to, be, and, and these could only form if Mars had been warm and had been wet. So this was, I mean, really a key finding to supporting the theory, you know, not just rounded rocks, you know, or rocks that looked like they had been weathered by water to down to minerals that could have only formed in water. So that, you know, that really uh, led to that hot, you know, again, there was, this was a, an incident where we had a wheel that was dragging on spirit. And because, you know, even in our failures, when things fail, we, we learned something. And so it kind of drug across this particular area and they were found that you know, there was a lot of silica there. So um, they were able to see that, hey, this could only could have formed out of a hot steam vent. So, uh, you know, it's very, uh, that was a very important, um, you know, also, you know, once an overheated, you know, heated habitat, um, you know, near, you know, volcanic, you know, we know that we, of course, there's Mons Olympus, the largest volcano uh, in the solar system um, work there. We, we, there had to have been powerful steam eruptions at one time, you know, and, and, and volcanism. I, I'll be straight with you. Looking at Mars, I see places that match places on Earth where I see uh, pyroclastic flows that have formed on, have been, have occurred on Earth. You can see the same thing on Mars. So that if there was a violent and extreme path, and, uh, past, and you know, that's a lot like Earth. And then a lot of this, when you're looking at it, especially in, in, in real color images, you're really seeing, you know, wow, that, that looks like Earth. And some of that looks like muddy soil. It's just, and so uh, it's, it's just some of the great science coming out of that. I think we got a couple of other really interesting shots coming up here. Yep. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, yeah, so, oh, interject, uh, Mike, if you wanted to, anything you yep. wanted to, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, again, um, you know, gypsum, <laughs> you know, uh, you, it, it only forms in water. I mean, uh, you can see fracturing in the rocks, um, you know, and so, and there's calcium there. Um, you know, we, we see calcium, for, you know, forming in all, all kinds of places on Earth. It's great that we, of course, we've, we've had, you know, hundreds of years of, of, of geology and geological ex exploration on our own Earth, trying to understand how things form, and, and now to go to another planet and find that, well, maybe those processes aren't in place now, but they were then. Something happened. We know that there's some kind of cataclysm, or maybe it wasn't a cataclysm. Maybe it was a gradual leashing over time, where then we hit reached reach a tipping point, which caused things to go bad. Which you know, again, for us on Earth, you know, we are gradually reaching a climate tipping point, and it could either go the way of Venus. Certainly, hope it wouldn't go the way of Mars. I hope it wouldn't go either one of those ways. But it's something for us to really be cognizant of and and seeing how mars has ended up is certainly something for us to study and to try to understand again more clay minerals and stuff just coming from a neutral ph uh, in the water so it shows that you had differing environments you had some some warm um pleasant environments you had some really hot um violent environments you had salty environments with high ph so in mars's past there was um, a, an environment um, uh, of such that, um, that led to the, the formation of different minerals. Um, and it's very much like Earth. So it's, it's you know, something, again, it's now, it's, now the, uh, uh, it's for us to understand what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll say that the fact that they're able to, you know, opportunity is able to find the, those clays and then also uh, using data and, um, you know, analysis from the orbiters, that then helped determine what's going to happen in the next missions. And we'll talk a yeah. little bit about that with the yeah. Curiosity rover um, and what, what it's doing now um, because yeah. of what was found with the amazing twin rovers. 
And I do want to point out one one thing is, and that it, all this is leading us to 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 the real leading question is, was there life? Because all these all these minerals and all these environments that we found are really the very kinds that we find on Earth that not only nurture but allow life to thrive. So that's uh, again, um, you know, part of what we're what what uh, again and again. I don't think it's an answer. It's not an answer that they were able to our question they were able to answer, but they certainly came close. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. All right, so this uh, this la oh, in the, up over le on the left hand panel here, this is really kind of the idea. Of, you could see where um, you know uh, we had uh, spirit landed and then kind of finally wound up. You mm -hmm. know, um, and you know you, you, here, I mean, and you're looking at, you're looking at this and you go, you know, that's this was just a wet environment that it was in, and so again, there were a lot of. Uh, there were over 100 impact craters that it that it uh, that they explored, um, you know, and so uh, it was just an incredible amount of, of data that they were able to, yep. to to gather. All right, let's go to the next one if you want. Absolutely. All right, and so then this is the rover Spirit, uh, and then and you can see Spirit's. Uh, that's where it landed. Thanks, Mike, for pointing that out there. And then it, you know, again, it it traveled quite a ways, four four point eight miles, you know. Um, and then, um, so, and then where it ended up and everything, um, yep. it's quite home a, plate. yeah, exactly. Home plate. And that was pretty much it for it. Yeah. Yep. All right. And then let's see. So we see our opportunity again, 28 point, 20.02, uh, 28.02 miles, you know, 5,100, uh, 5, uh, souls, um, you know, and just, uh, an incredible, um, uh, tra tra traverse that it went see that little green line my michael is mike is kind of uh circling the the landing part right there yeah yes there's ended up in there, Valley. There, yeah yeah yep. right. let's go to the next one and then this is kind of this la opportunities last panoramic view um and you know, when you're looking at this you can go wow well you know what i see i see on the right here i see things that look like wet plains over on the left i see what's dry you know and then you see all kinds of environment right in the in the middle of that and let's go to spirit. Uh, this is all right. This is unfortunately yeah. this was the the uh, the death knell, so to speak. This was it was that that dust storm of June 20, uh, 2018. You, you can kind of see that it just kept intensifying. So there's the sun on the on the far left, and as this dust storm intensifies, that, that the, all the way to the right, that is the 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 uh, the, the uh, our sun. Mm -hmm. So and then. So without, you know, again, it, it didn't have atomic batteries. It only had solar panels. And unfortunately, you had to charge that thing constantly. There just yep. wasn't enough energy coming from the sun to strike those solar panels. And plus, it was a bad, at a bad angle, roughly 30 yeah. degrees, right? It was, it was a, and, and I think the other thing to note is that, I mean, these things were designed for 90 days. So yeah. there was no original thought that this was going to weather an entire Martian winter. Mm -hmm. um, where you really didn't have the sun um, available to charge the batteries for very long. So they literally had to find places to park the rovers. They, they mm -hmm. looked for inclines where they could you know, figure out a way, can we drive up this steep embankment and leave the rover there parked so that even in the winter, it can just get, get enough sun. So yeah, mm -hmm. once, but once you kind of deprive it of its energy source, uh, it can't stay warm. You go to the so, next slide. Yep. It's a sad, sad end. Portal, portal rover. Yeah. Yep. That was these were, the, were the actual messages it sent yes. uh, right before. And it was uh, getting cold. Yeah. Um, right. But then right. I'll let you go. Sorry, Doug, your turn. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yep. Um, uh, Let's see the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, yep. and the Mars Reconnaissance or Orbiter. Uh, again, we're talking about um, a, a spacecraft that's been orbiting Mars for almost for 16 years. No, sorry, for um, 11 years now, right? No, no, 16. No, years. 16 years. 16, yeah. 16 years, and it, it's it's projected that it's going to continue on uh, for through uh, through 2025. I mean, it's uh, it still has um, its. Um, um, it's uh, it's major, um, you know. It still have a, has a lot to go to go, um, 
so it's it's quite a quite a quite a craft um and so it it, it actually began you know returning high resolution mapping um to uh back to earth from mars also part of the of the uh of the uh, deep space network anything else you want to say about that no just i think it's 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 they're absolutely critical and doug you mentioned it earlier how a lot of these um you know, different missions then tie into each other. Yeah. Um, you're, you're piggybacking on one one another. You had, uh, we even mentioned earlier that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was actually able to take, you know, these high resolution uh, pictures as well as do some analysis, helping find not only, um, you know, better landing um, locations for future missions, but also able to then say, you know, study those areas. Ooh, you yeah. know what? We're detecting <laughs> certain types of minerals here um, right. We want to make sure we're focusing there, uh, you know, and, and sending the next mission yeah. that can potentially explore these areas. So it, yeah. it's actually using a gamma ray spectroscopy on the surface of Mars. So we're actually able to see where there are large mineral deposits and everything. And it's able the problem with a with a spectroscopy uh, detector like the one they have on the on the rover on the Mars um, reconnaissance orbiter is, is that over time it actually gets less and less resolution. What they're able to do is they have a special annealing process on the, in their orbiter. They're able to heat, um, I guess, uh, whatever it is, they're able to kind of recast that every time. So that it, they're able to kind of, if as once things begin going out of uh, becoming fuzzy, they can kind of go into an annealing uh, mode and actually recast their, um, whatever they're using to, to detect the gamma radiation coming back up from, the, from Mars and actually re, uh, recast their resolution. So it, it's, uh, it's really quite ingenious what they, yep. what they did with, with the orbiter. Go ahead, yeah. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, let's go to the next one, the Phoenix Lander. So you guys may re uh, remember this one. This one landed in the polar regions. This one was successful. It built off the, off the, uh, the prior failure of the, of the first lander that felt the jerk of the drogue chute and it didn't cut off. <laughs> And then when it, it finally and it finally sa uh, safely touched down on uh, on uh, the uh, on the surface of Mars up in the pol polar region and everything. And so it actually served as a polar, as a weather station for the near polar region of Mars. And so um, it uh, it performed very well. Let's see. I, I'm uh, it's it's no longer working right now. Correct. Uh, but they did uh, they did quite do quite a bit of of, of near polar weather observations, being able to dig down and actually find frozen water ice in, uh, in uh, just under the Martian soil, you know, it makes it possible, at least this is one of the first possibilities saying, hey, there's something that we can do with this. So, yeah. And not CO2 ice, yeah, water, water ice. Water ice, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, one thing to just to call out is, especially as we start to look at these uh, uh, spacecraft, thinking back what we said about um, the Mars Sojourner um, and you know, NASA changing its focus to try and do kind of cheaper, more often uh, sorts of missions, uh, kind of pay attention to the form factors that are being used. So this is a picture of Phoenix. Yep. All right, that's all I have for that. Okay. Yeah, the, the Phobos uh, Grunt Yungo, Yung Ho, um, mm -hmm. Uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the People's Republic of China and uh, the the uh, the uh, Soviets uh, didn't uh, uh, it failed. Um, yep. it's, it just it actually um, never left uh, low Earth orbit. Um, yep. So, yeah. And then uh, and then we have now we have Curiosity, and so this was definitely building on the other other scientific pack packages. You know, it's still operational today. Um, Curiosity is is uh, really a, is uh, really quite amazing. Uh, and you know, if you notice, uh, just looking at it, uh, no solar panels. So this was literally being powered by a small seven pound um, plutonium um, battery. Uh, which basically is it's it's generating um, uh, electricity off the the decay uh, of the plutonium. The plutonium. Uh, so basically, that heat transference from the plutonium to thermocouples is generating its electricity. So it's able to actually survive those those nights, those long nights, without being uh, you know without uh, losing its uh, ability to function. Reminds me of the line from Back to the Future where I think uh, Marty McFly 
asks or says something like, "This sucker's a uh, you know, nuclear." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, and this is uh, the, our in the overall insertion and landing. Right. So, I mean, you saw, I mean, NASA really continually takes these amazing risks. And this was really one of the first ones, the first one that we actually saw a sky crane used, uh, which was just, you know, it, first of all, it, it was incredibly risky, had never been tried before. One exploding bolt that didn't work would have destroyed the whole, the whole landing operation. But I mean, they learned so much data just in everything that they put into this, into the heat shield, the back shell, the parachute, um, you know, and the sky crane itself, you know, and then, you know, it was uh, it just an amazing technological feat, which, of course, has really guaranteed, uh, of course, and, and Mike will talk about uh, perseverance. I mean, we, we saw almost the same scenario, but had they never attempted that, it would always be something that was in question. So NASA always dares great things. And so this was one of the really innovative ways of, of landing a spacecraft. The other thing that's really cool is, is that you could land it, jettison the sky crane, and now you're not having to carry around all that heavy equipment, you know, spent rocket motors that you'll never ever use ever again. And you can dedicate all the power and everything to powering the rover and the science packages. Let's go to the next slide there, Mike. Um, Unless you want to interject something. Yep. Yeah, nope. Nope. All right. I, I just, I love this picture. I really do. I mean, it, it landed in at Gale Crater. That's the panel you see on the left. But when you look at this, this, at the rover looking towards Gale Crater, and it's, it's you can see the different strata of, you know, of, of minerals and, and the geologic time of Mars, of the past of Mars. So, I mean, you, and this is just like you would see something, you know, on earth, you know, here on earth. And so you're really, this was really a rich place to land, to put a, a rover and to, to study. So uh, let's say uh, you want to uh, go on to the next slide. Yeah, and just, or, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to note. So you, you've got here, it's a little hard to see, but you have the landing ellipse uh, where they landed inside Gale Crater. So you got the big crater um, all the way around. You have Mark, Mount Sharp basically rising from within. And this was the landing ellipse that they, um, you know, shot for. But yeah, I mean, um, it, it is amazing. You know, we're, we're, they're literally, um, you know, in, in trying to understand Mars um, and, you know, its habitability, it is all written in into this the chemistry of the rocks, and this is and such a fantastic place to um, uh, to to investigate exactly. because as you move through, um, you know you're you're literally looking at snapshots of Mars's um, you know uh, geologic, geologic history. Pack. Yeah, it's past. Yeah, and you can look at that and you go, well, why? That's those are sedimentary layers. You can look yeah. at them. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, we we only know that you get you get that from with with you know um, constant or you know in a, in a, or the water cycle where you've got water, then the water dries up and the minerals kind of are out there. Then you get more water, and it's mm -hmm. that continuous process. Mm -hmm. All right, and so this is basically showing you basically up in the upper right hand corner. That's where you you've got or yeah upper kind of mid right. Yeah. That's where you've got your landing zone. You know again you know. It's traveled 15.57 miles, uh, you know, th over 3,000 souls, and down to the where Mike's got the tag down there. It, that's where you you've actually got the lander itself or the rover itself, yeah. you know, currently in study now. You know, again, it's still you know it's it's dragging a wheel right now, but uh, it's it's uh, it's it's still operational and still still performing science. You know, it's a good point. I'm just going to back up here yeah. um, and you can kind of see where its wheels are. So, um, you know, might be hard to look, but, you know, nice big gaping hole <laughs> in, in one of Curiosity's wheels. So um, yeah. they are taking a beating. Um, no, yeah. no, no doubt about that. Well, it was, a, you know, it was it was a little bit cryptic because, you know, they initially had made the wheels. They wanted they had designed the wheels to, to spell out JPL every time the, ro the rover. Uh, went across the surface and uh, some people took umbrage at that 
So they the holes are actually Morse code for JPL. <laughs> yeah, these, these little rectangular. Uh, yeah. So it's still saying JPL, but just in Morse code as it as it yeah. drives along the surface. But <laughs> all right, okay. All right. And then by the way, I, I want to. I think there it's at Saul three thousand ninety eight ninety nine. Something like that. So I mean, this is as of you know just uh, you know yeah. only a couple of weeks old as far as the um, you know overall trajectory and how far it's traveled. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next. One. I, I just love this picture, you know, uh, because again, I mean, you're if you, you this is really where the what's in the bottom foreground. This is where uh, we started, and it's looking forward to where it's gonna go. Of course, it's right now where, where Mike has that circled on that, on that upper ridge, that's where it's gone, you know? And it's literally driven through, if you think about it in terms of geologic age, it's driven through millions of years of, of, of the geologic past of Mars. And again, still doing super stuff. I just love this, this you know, it's, it's just, that's, that is millions of years into, the, into Mars's future from where, where it's at, and down into the past and then up into the future. So it's yep. pretty great. It's amazing. All right. Okay. And then 2013. Let's see where I'm at here. All right. So there's uh, from that. Um, uh, then we have a, a final. Uh, we have um, our, our our friends in India um, actually uh, have the Mars Orbiter mission that actually was inserted in 2013. Uh, that was successful. And as I understand, yep. I think it's still. Still, still in, in process, so. Yep, going very well. so. All right, so that takes us up to the, oh, and MAVEN. Yeah, MAVEN, which is yep. basically, you know, the, basically it's, it's an orbiter. It's actually trying to study the, uh, the evolutionary aspects of Mar the Martian atmosphere. And so, and again, another, it's another communication point. And, you know, as, as you guys have probably seen, you know, we're going, like, why are we getting first really grainy pictures? And why aren't we getting really fast upload? Well, it's because the upload uh, to these, to these orbiters is really quite, you know, slow. I mean, we're, we're talking on the order of, um, of, you know, really 1960s or not, I want to say, let's say 1980s or 1990s you know, communications, and they're only getting a few kilobits, maybe yeah. five, 418 kilobits a second yeah. getting up to this, these, and they have to wait for these, these orbiters to go over. So it's really great when you, when you can get multiple or orbiters tied into the deep space network, then what you can do is you can have a continuous stream of data and they can switch off much like we switch off cell towers as our cars, you know, drive along. So that's what's really great about having deep space network. Now, you know, I do know that, you know, like the Chinese are also at least, or they have an orbiter now, but they're not playing the game with us. So they're, they're not, they're not tied into that. So we don't get the advantage of being able to use that orbiter to be able to enhance our speed. This is why it does take us, you know, days to get really uh, great shots out of, uh, out of Mars. Um, it's just the slow data rate, but we had, we do have to wait, but at least we have three, three working orbiters right now that can, can orbit and actually um, pull data out and send it back to, uh, to the, to, or to the earth. Yep. But, yep. And by the way, 1992 called and they want their 14.4 K modem back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a big right. deal in 1992. I, I'm I know. You. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> Uh, so All we right. went from 2013 to 2016. Um, so we had the joint uh, European Union and Russian Federation ExoMars. Um, so uh, it did uh, achieve orbit, um, but the, um, the lander did not. Um, and then we have in 2018, we have InSight. Um, and that was, again, I, I mentioned earlier to kind of remember the form factors of, of these different things. This looks remarkably similar to what we saw with um, Phoenix. Yeah, with, with the Phoenix lander and even somewhat similar to what we, you know, there's, there's definitely, you know, uh, when you look at the base, it even kind of looks a little bit like what we had for Viking. So, um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, we're, we're reusing the same platforms and, and we'll see that also with Perseverance. So. Um, you know, and for insight, uh, what they really wanted to understand was the formation and evolution of the actual planet, understanding, um, you know, the levels of tectonic activity within Mars. So um, they do have a seismograph, 
um, they do have also a temperature probe. So it's, it's almost, uh, it doesn't lander, but that actually is an impactor um, probe that, that goes down, um, I want to say, um, maybe you know, a, a meter or two, if, if memory serves me. So they are taking the temperature also of Mars. So again, trying to understand um, specifically what's going on uh, with tectonic activity there. Um, and then in 2020, uh, so this is this past year, um, it's pretty amazing. You had the, uh, the EU, uh, EAU um, um, actually send a mission, an orbiter. It arrived uh, a few weeks before uh, Perseverance did, uh, but it is happily orbiting um, Mars right now. Um, we also had the Tianwen-1, um, the Chinese orbiter, um, that uh, it is successfully orbiting. They're waiting. Um, they're still yeah. doing testing, uh, but they do have a lander and a rover as well. But as of last time I checked, which was sometime this week, um, they still haven't um, you know, uh, moved to the next uh, step to actually um, send the lander and the uh, deploy the rover. And then, of course, we have um, the Mars 2020, the Perseverance and uh, Ingenuity um, mission. And um, again, this is something that is quite uh, Im impressive because uh, it uses very, very similar um, uh, form factor. Uh, the Perseverance rover looks almost identical to Curiosity, although it's a little bit heavier, um, use the same sort of landing um, uh, technology uh, with the sky crane maneuver, etc. Uh, but of course, though, um, not only do we have a rover, but we have a, quite an amazing helicopter. And I think Doug is going to talk to us a little bit about, about that. Um, but I did want to at least uh, uh, kind of show you. Uh, so this is the picture right outside of JPL. Um, you've got the, uh, basically, this is Curiosity. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is Curiosity. Perseverance is going to be very, very similar. But do note that the uh, tires are, or the wheels are different. Um, so this is, you know, about seven feet tall. Um, lengthwise, it's about the size of a small car, um, but the weight of a, you know, a, a, an SUV. You have the, um, you know, the twin rovers, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, and then our microwave-sized uh, Sojourner there. So with that, Doug, I'll pass it over uh, to you for uh, update on Ingenuity. Yeah, so we'll talk about uh, Ingenuity. Uh, probably what you guys don't realize is, is that we actually landed a nuclear aircraft carrier on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really what, uh, what, what Ingenuity is. It's, it is. It is an aircraft, the first aircraft to actually take flight on another planet. Um, it's experimental. Okay, so this is really a proof of concept. A lot like Sojourner was all those years ago, uh, it, it really doesn't have a science mission so to speak, unlike Perseverance, which I know Mike will talk about uh, later, but uh, ingenuity itself is, is really a proof of concept. Can we do this? And uh, as we all know, it was successful. We'll see that in just a minute. That's going to that's gonna lead to much, much greater things um, in the past. So this is part of, the, part of a, another slide presentation I have on seven things to know about ingenuity and so the first one was it's experimental okay let's go to the next one uh, so it's it's really the first powered controlled flight on another planet and it was actually you got to uh, understand the amount of of work that really went into trying to understand how do we make another aircraft that can fly on a planet like mars so uh, i love this this shot because you can really see that you know these are really large. This, uh, by the way, this is about four pounds worth of material all together. Uh, these these wings are made out of out of a, a carbon fiber um, uh, process, uh, and they only weigh about the weight of a piece of paper. So they're they're really incredibly light, but they're able to lift this four pound aircraft. Now on Mars, it's only about 1.3 pounds. But um, it's uh, so there's a lot of engineering that went into it. You know, we actually and of course we have those uh, chambers, um, uh, uh, NASA has chambers where they can reduce the atmosphere, they can reproduce the atmosphere of Mars, and then they could test it and everything. But I mean, it's just really kind of incredible that we were able, actually able to do something like this. 
um, to, uh, off the bat. So let's. So, so there was a, quite a bit of difficulty yep. that went into design this. Go ahead, yeah, Mike. And, and I think it's worth noting that I mean, when you when you think about the the rarefied atmosphere of, mm -hmm. of, of Mars, it is you know one some odd percent the, Only the, the 1%. atmosphere. Yeah, of, yeah, of, of Earth. Earth. So mm -hmm. where you know here we use propellers and they'll basically use the atmosphere, use the the density of there to help push and propel itself through the air. You don't have that air. Um, that you know that that in, on Mars, so you have to build something incredibly light, and but you've got to use these incredibly large uh, propellers. You know, you right. compare this to a you know a typical drone that we might use here on Earth. You know, you can have a you know a good sized drone with this, these tiny propellers, and it'll it'll fly. But and this, they're only, and they're only use... spending about six hundred RPM versus twenty four hundred or or greater RPM that this has to fly to spend. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next uh, the next slide. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we have uh, on the on the on Ingenuity. Uh, there are some a few little uh, pieces. Of course, we've got these really specialized uh, carbon fiber blades that uh, that we're talking about. Um, so that's um, uh, we already discussed that. There are in this mainly most of it sits in this little square aluminized package that you see here. Mm -hmm. That's uh, basically it's got the batteries to help power the 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, ingenuity. It's got, of course, these legs. Uh, they're also made of, of carbon fiber filaments that uh, you know help help it land and actually remain uh, um, uh, uh, stable. Uh, the sensors and cameras now. So uh, they in this they actually kind of show them on the side here. But actually, if you're kind of able to turn it over on the bottom. There's actually uh, there's two cameras and there's a laser altimeter in the uh, in the on, on the package. You could just kind of turn it up like that. You'd be able to see there's the laser altimeter, and then there's uh, there's a, a black and white um, or a monochrome uh, navigational camera, and then there's a color camera, which is is returning the color images that that we see. And then of course then then this it also contains the av avionics package. It is an intelligent rover. It is itself uh, just a you know a, a flight uh, a flying one, um, but it's you know it's able you know it has flight avoidance. It's able to you know uh, so uh, and it's able to you know store commands, execute a command sequence, and then return. So it, it but it it has its own intelligence. Has heaters and insulation in there to keep it from totally freezing at night and everything, um, and so. Uh, it's uh, the nights get pretty cold there. Um, atop the uh, there's kind of really cool atop the uh, the right. Uh, let me just say before we actually talk about the the actual top part of it, right in between here, uh, right between the rotors and uh, the top and the solar panel we have at the top here. These are the actual antennas that are used to to uh, to communicate with the with the uh, with with uh, uh, perseverance. And then uh, there's also right up here, you'll see that, uh, so this is a solar panel that will keep the batteries charged, but they're not gonna keep it charged forever. They're just really kind of there to help it stay topped off. We know it doesn't really, it's not really getting the full charging that it would have gotten. Uh, as I think Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, this is only expected to last for about four or five flights max. Yeah, four, you know, uh, then, five flights max, I think. And, you know, basically once it was uh, deployed from um, uh, Perseverance, mm -hmm. uh, I believe they said it's got a, you know, it's got a, a mission timeline. In other words, it will no longer be able to get enough power. Um, right. But I think they said it was ex expected 30 days and up to five flights. Right. Yeah, so that's it's it has, it's going to have a limited time. But again, its concept very much most, most likely the next kinds of rovers you're going to see you're going to see better aircraft coming out of this. Yeah. So yeah, um, and I, and I believe the avionics, Doug, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they're, they're running Windows 10. I think that's what Steven said. No, oh really? It, run, it runs on Linux. Oh well, so. uh, maybe <laughs> less maybe less than five flights. <laughs> no, it's, it's Linux, so we're good. We're you good. have to reboot Windows 10 every every uh, 24 <laughs> hours, or you're choked. I yeah. mean, <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so and then uh, and then what's kind of cool is that there there right underneath the the solar panel there's a patch uh, that's actually a small swath of patch that was cut from the original White Wright Brothers flyer uh, from 1903 and it's actually affixed to the bottom of that you know and it's kind of an homage to the Wright Brothers you know 117 years of flight um, that they were able to that they that they really of innovation and in flight that that's happened uh, with mankind over that time. Uh, and it was an homage to them. 
we are first in flight here in North Carolina, here in North Carolina and um, Ingenuity is first in flight on Mars. So it's, it is an homage to, to uh, their, their amazing work and everything. And again, 117 years worth of avionics and, and innovation is just, uh, and I think it was a, a fitting tribute. Yeah. So that's pretty much what we have in Ingenuity. Um, let's go to the next, the next one. Um, it was kind of cool. I mean, uh, I, now I, there was, there was actually an ablative plate that was under this. Um, but, um, and that, that was jettisoned uh, not too long ago. And then the Rover was actually attached, um, under, underneath, uh, here it is under, underneath ingenuity. And then if we go to the next, the next slide, this was it being kind of being deployed, uh, and dropped on the ground. And then um, let's go to the next slide. The next slide is really just kind of just talking about all of the all of the challenges that that we actually uh, were able to complete in terms of actually creating this this rover on Earth. I mean, this little flying rover on Earth. Um, you know, communicating through all the various um, interfaces that it had to communicate through, survive. Um, you know, uh, and then let's go to the next page. Um, you know, just think about what what ingenuity has been able to do one step at a time. You know, it it's first of all, you know, it had to be packaged. <laughs> you know, it was tested, built, and then it had to be packaged and then tested to make sure that it was going to work. It survived this cruise to Mars. You know, uh, and then well, it sur and survived the the launch. I mean, the, the, the launch, launch itself yeah. is a very violent process. Right. Exactly. And I mean, they make it a little, I mean, the, I, even I hear the astronauts complain about how, how rickety it is, you know, going up in the capsules and everything. They don't make that kind of comfort for the avionics and the equipment. <laughs> they just have to survive the, the massive shaking period. Um, you know, and then it, it has to get all the way, you've got to imagine, go all the way through entry into the Martian atmosphere, all that, that the violent, you know, shaking with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the entering craft and then the separation of the heat shield separation from the aerodynamic shell, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the jerk from the, from the drogue shoots and then the main shoots deploying the slowdown and then the, the, the deployment from the sky crane, making it down to the planet. And then it's got to drive along, you know, strapped to the belly of the ro of this Rover and then, uh, you know, and then it has to be autonomously deployed on the Ma Martian surface. And then even once we got there, we had to be able to successfully communicate with it. As you all know, during part of that communication, as they began the rotor spin up and everything, they noticed they had basically a watchdog timer that timed out. And for those of you who don't know what a watchdog timer is, that's a special timer that a lot of us use when we're doing, when we developed operating systems that when you actually begin a process that's going to not return, you've got to have a, or not return for a long time, you don't want your system to lock up waiting for a process to turn. The watchdog timer is a special timer that says, oh, things haven't happened in a while. I'm going to issue an interrupt and I want you to stop and turn. And so they were, so that basically stopped them and probably stopped them from probably crashing the rover, the, the flyer. So, um, anyway, uh, so they were able to, then you got to think about the technology technology here. They were able to create a craft a fix, test it here on, on earth, get it, uh, and then download it to the Rover, the, or sorry, to the flyer, to the helicopter. And they had, to, and that all had to go through from earth out to deep state sky network down to the, um, you know, uh, orbiters and down to the, uh, well, down to, so, uh, down to perseverance, then to the. Yeah, the orbiters, then to perseverance, and then, uh, and then to ingenuity, you know, and that, you know, that had to, uh, that had to work. Now that download had to work. I don't know if you guys have ever had a download and it, it crashed in the middle of the download. You know, uh, it's it's always pretty bad. But I will do. I do know that they have a. If that were to happen, they have a safe mode that they, they flip over into, and they're able to basically restore, to to the prior prior loads so they don't ever lose the actual good operating system that they're working with so i mean it's it but it was it's a technological feat and so it's you know it's just basically there's a success built on top of success built on top of success and it's a, it's just an amazing team that we have that's uh, that's gone into development 
And let's go to, I think, the final slide on this one. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. So basically, we have it. Now here it is fully deployed on Mars. The rover's dr driven away from it, you know, and we're about ready to go for success. Yep. So let's go to the next one. And if you'll hit the play button on that, yep. Mike, hopefully it's there somewhere. Yep. <laughs> All right, we should see those rotors spinning. There we go. The rotors are beginning to spin up now. The avionics package is kicking in. Um, and so there we go. There we have liftoff. And I was I was actually watching this. Uh, I, I, well, I would say I was watching the team at NASA while they were doing this. And they were, you know, they were all just kind of sitting around in their chairs. And it was a lot of, a lot of you know, chatter, minor chatter among them. And uh, when um, when this when it actually did this, and they got the signal back from um, from from the from the flyer, uh, the the guy who was there who was controlling it just calmly said, "We have uh, rotor spin up. We we have rotor spin up, uh, ascent, um, left turn, descent, rotor spin down," and that's all he said. And everybody's just kind of looking around, and they go, oh, "Wait." <laughs> it happened you know they were just super excited <laughs> yeah. that it had actually occurred and so uh you know it was it was kind of an interesting moment to watch but it you know if you know it really is a first for mankind it really yeah. is we were watching just amazing history here uh that occurred all right yeah i'll, I'll and, be quiet here <laughs> and, and just to know i mean so yeah this was this was taken from perseverance uh mm -hmm. with, with its mass cam um mm -hmm. so that that's where we got that piece but um yeah, I see we're we're getting pretty long into into oh, the right yeah. that. So um, I think we're gonna kind of stop it there. Uh, I didn't really have much to, to talk about um, perseverance. There's many other uh, talks. In fact, I would say um, if anyone is really interested in it, um, check out the um, uh, North Carolina Museum of, of Natural Sciences. There was basically a five-hour program that was put on mm. uh, with the museum and the other um, JPL Solar System ambassadors. Um, and talked about all the different parts of perseverance, um, the science objectives, uh, you name it. So if you, you know, if it interests you, definitely um, you know, check out that um, uh, series. But it's a, again, it's a five-hour um, uh, kind of uh, almost webinar, if you will, that was, that was put on. So there's a there's a question um, about the um, return communication time to Mars. Yep. Well, that all depends. Or at least so, the average. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it, it's, average. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're right now we're approximately there's it's there's about 170, 180 million miles uh, between Earth and Mars. So um, yeah, I think uh, Amy's got it there. It's, a, it's about 16 minutes right now. It can be as, as low as seven minutes. Um, but again, at times it can be uh, plus to 20. So it just all depends where we are in our orbit. Um, also, there are times when there it's impossible to communicate uh, with with the um, with, with Mars because you've got the sun right in the middle, and there's no way to get a signal around the sun. So that, there, there is there are times where there's absolutely no communication. So um, I say, if uh, we have any questions, I don't think we um, um, have any other questions in the chat. Um, thank you, um, Stephen Blake. Uh, yeah. Atmospheric pressure on Mars is 0. 0.1 psi compared to Earth's uh, 14.7. Go ahead and ask uh, everybody to unmute. Yeah. And if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. Yep. So, unless anyone has any questions, we will. Make sure no questions. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody uh, for allowing uh, Doug and I to uh, present this topic. So thank you for joining.